Tonight on Between Rounds, we're stepping into the world of mixed martial arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with Professor Pete Jeffrey. From the mats of Triforce MMA in Rhode Island, Pete has transitioned from a formidable professional fighter to a revered coach, shaping the future of New England's MMA scene. With a career spanning from the early days of no holds barred fights to coaching athletes competing in Bellator and UFC, Pete's journey embodies the spirit of martial arts. Join us as we explore the evolution of MMA, the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and the impact of martial arts on life beyond the cage. Stay tuned as we dive deep with Professor Pete Jeffrey, right here on Between Rounds. Hi everyone, this is Mike Petraca, and welcome to the World Cup of Martial Arts Between Rounds series where we put the spotlight on amazing martial artists doing phenomenal things both on and off the mat. And tonight, we have an accomplished guest that is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt under the Tim Burrell and Carlos Machado systems and was an active professional mixed martial artist from 2005 to 2012. And he currently coaches many of New England's top professional and amateur prospects that you may have seen fight on Bellator and UFC promotions Coming to us right from his gym after class right now at Triforce MMA in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Please welcome Professor Pete Jeffrey. Thank you very Pete, much. How you uh, doing, buddy? Good, man. Good. Uh, just getting done doing some training here. We are in uh, our first week at our new facility. So it's been really exciting. I, I almost still feel like an imposter in my own building because... <laughs> This place is huge. We got a whole bunch of new mat spaces, and it's nice and it's clean, and everything's done the way we want it. So it's quite the performance center. I'm, uh, I'm real happy. The members are pretty happy with the way things came out. So more champions. Sweet man, sweet, and and and, and it's probably still got that new smell and not uh, that sweaty smell yeah. that comes. Yeah, with gold yeah. Chips. That's going away quickly for sure. <laughs> I think we packed like. Uh, 80 people in one class on the first day back. So, you know, wow, that, that's, that's, that's what we want. Big classes. Wow. that That's amazing. Tell, tell me, actually, this wasn't a question that I had prepared, but since you mentioned it, how, how do you teach a class of that size? Uh, well, that class uh, in particular was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So uh, I'm used to doing seminars for up to, like I've done some in the Carlos Machado Association that was like 200 and something people there. So, you try to set it up where you teach stuff that you, the basic white belts are going to get something from, but also black belts will also find a way to, uh, you know, to get something on. So you teach it both sides of the spectrum and hopefully everybody is uh, still entertained. Awesome. Awesome. And, and, and tell me, tell me from the beginning, how did you get involved in martial arts and specifically Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Uh, it's kind of crazy. So I, um, I'm just walking away from these guys doing some training over here. Sure. Uh, I, I went to school for music. I was always a hockey player. So, um, one day back in probably 2001, my brother started to, uh, work with uh, a guy in his gym doing this stuff called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And he was like, you should come down and check it out. And, yeah. you know, I was looking for another yin to my yang as far as like, you know, workout stuff. So I went in and tried it out. And, you know, that was back, you know, the UFC started in 1994 or five. So yeah. 2001, it was still like Hoist Gracie versus Ken Shamrock. Mm. So we started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu then. And, and at the time, it was like the big secret. You know, nobody really knew this, you know, ground fighting. So yeah. we felt like we were just way ahead of the curve. And back in that day, we watched Pride. You know, Pride was oh, yeah. the number one of station of that everybody was into and watching. And uh, if you started fighting back in that time, uh, you definitely didn't do it for the money. And you definitely didn't do it for the future fame. You just mm -hmm. did it because you were a little bit crazy. And, and that's what you like to do. But for me, it was just an extension of the arts. And then one thing led to another. We ended up getting our first space as the place to train in because all the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and kickboxing schools we were also working at, they were tired of us going through all their walls. Because back in the day, people didn't have all wall pads and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. we would just go through the sheetrock essentially. And uh that yeah, they were pretty tired of that. So we ended up getting a spot in a boxing gym in the back yep. just to train and people started asking us to teach classes. 
So, you know, they said, hey, how about a Monday class? Uh, yeah, right, yeah. We'll do Monday class. And it just kind of turned into a Wednesday class and then turned into Tuesday, Thursday. And, you know, people started saying we had a team. So then we were like, yeah, we got a team. We have a team. And we just started to go with that. So um, really, it was a group in the beginning of, you know, NHB and MMA fighters at the time, just trying to find a home and trying to find a place to work out. So um, that's really how it happened. And everything else just kind of fell in around it. You know, like I had a couple of pro fights before the UFC had a TV show. So yep. we certainly weren't doing it for the money. And uh, it just flourished from there. Like who who knew that mixed martial arts was going to take off like this? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, you got celebrities out there doing it. Oh, yeah. Um, Multi-billion dollar family does it. It's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, a, a little bit of luck and, you know, a lot of passion. I, I would have been doing it for free. Yeah. I'd still do it for free, you know, and especially coming up being a musician, I would have done that for pretty close to free as well. You know, just to do what you love to do and to make enough money to get by is if you set that standard, you'll always do things that you love, you know, if, yeah. and the money comes fantastic you know you did it through hard work but you know do things that you like to do because life's too short 100 percent, man 100 percent. and when when did you just start start to decide to go from amateur to pro because i know you had quite so, a few pro fights i had no choice there were in the at that time period there was no so for my first couple of fights they still called it nhb mm -hmm. which is like no holds barred fighting and we fought in rings so there was no amateurs it was you either went pro or you didn't do it Wow. So I, I didn't have any amateurs and you know, going back and like you look at the records are all over the place because it depended on like if they claim the show. I don't know. The promoter didn't claim it on his taxes or whatever. So it's sort of, I don't know how it worked, but a lot oh, of the shows in the beginning were pretty crazy. Uh, there's at least a bunch of them that didn't make my record. And again, they were two minute rounds. I mean, two like four minute rounds. They weren't yeah. even three, three, three rounds. So maybe they didn't count it as pro. I don't know. But those are the fun days back, you know, back in the day where there was, believe it or not, one generation or so before me. So you had you had what you had more fights than is actually listed on your your professional yeah, record. Yeah, I, I had I had 13 or 14 fights. I have to go back and add them all up again. And I think I only have 10. With that. Yep. And and tell me, man, tell me about your martial arts influences, specifically with the connection with Carlos Machado, the legendary Brazilian world masters champion. And uh, Tim Burrow, who was one of the first Americans to receive a black belt from Machado. Yeah, um, I was lucky enough that uh, Tim Burrill ended up moving from Texas uh, to Rhode Island. And, you know, back in that time, if you throw like a purple belt on the mat, it was like seeing a unicorn. Wow. So, uh, you know, it was like whispers. Oh, this guy's a purple belt. And <laughs> Tim was already a black belt in 2001. Yeah. So he came running in and basically took over. And we were all just like, yep, you're in charge. And uh, he uh, he got a good group of people together, uh, you know, that were he has that that mindset of train hard, you know, kind of shut up and train and mm. just, to, you know, do your thing and, and get it and work hard and, and go home. And we had a really good group of people that, you know, a lot of them went into MMA as well, had that same mindset, and we, we yeah. built a good team off that for a long time. And uh, then as things got into mixed martial arts, you know, we yeah. ended up doing, having a mixed martial arts school because Tim Burrow was, you know, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach. Yeah. And, you know, things just kind of went from there. Um, but he was uh, my coach all the way up to Black Belt. And then obviously because the lineage went through him and through Carlos Machado, I had a pretty good um, – rapport with carlos uh for for a long time i i worked for his organization uh for a long time as well and and now i'm just kind of um kind of doing my own thing focusing on really building my schools up um i have another school in florida with mm -hmm. uh okay. chuck cole steel o'neill who is in the ufc and is a great friend of mine and is, is one of my uh main training partners for a long time he actually that's fought good. my brother so it's pretty crazy oh wow we, that's amazing yeah I, I own a gym with him as well and it's a tri-four school so that's in florida and then we just rebuilt our new headquarters here and you know we're looking at just keep, success, keep building man. up the, you're having building success up the brand and making champions yeah when you when you were an active fighter pete what was your training regimen like so Back at that time, uh, especially because I was working for myself, uh, I would just, you know, I would hustle music gigs. 
I'd be doing a little bit of construction stuff and then any spare time because I didn't have kids or whatever in between that was training. So it would usually be like wake up, train, go to work for a while and then train again at nighttime. And then I would usually play gigs on the weekends and stuff. Um, and that was my schedule for a long time. Wow. So, you wow. know, that's it. It's it's you, you take up your time with with stuff that you like to do rather than sitting on the couch, putting on weight, going to the bar, drinking all the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's a hard lifestyle, but it's it's better. It's, Rat- I think it's gratifying. It's, it's more gra- it's more gratifying. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, I need to feel like I did something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and, and and tell me, I uh, is there is there ever a healthy way to cut weight for a fight? Yeah, I, we do that all the time. I'm, we have a sauna here, but like the sauna shouldn't be the way that you're cutting weight. Mm-hmm. The sauna should be your last like five or six pounds. If you really like, we try to keep it right around there. But when you're doing that last five or six pounds, you're pretty hydrated. Yeah. And then we do a water load system. We try to keep it pretty safe, but like our fighters need to be relatively close, uh, you know, two weeks out mm-hmm. uh, before we mm-hmm. start thinking about it. If it's not looking like we're going to make it, we're, I'm not going to be that coach. That's going to tell guys like, Hey, you know, get in there. We can do 18 pounds. Like, no, we're yeah. not doing 18 pounds. Like you're not prepared for this fight. If you didn't take your weight properly and you didn't train properly or you missed days, or maybe you were hurt during the training camp, those mm-hmm. are all signs that I wish as a fighter, I paid more attention to. Right. I didn't really have a coach telling me. So now I'm the coach and all the stuff that I tend to feel like I failed at, I'm teaching these guys to not fail. So that, that definitely helps. Uh, it's dangerous cutting weight. I wish mm-hmm. that they would either add more weight classes or, or figure out a way to get people to fight a little bit closer to their weight. I know one FC yeah. started to do um, a, like a next day weigh in where you can only put on so much weight to show that naturally your body is functioning as a, let's say 155 or a 170. Right. So I, hopefully that stuff in the future um, becomes a little bit more popular with the organizations and uh, you know, keep it, keep it safe. We do enough things that are not safe. Right. And if you can imagine basically putting yourself on death's door and giving yourself the flu the day before Mm. uh, a mixed martial arts fight, you know, a lot of it is is the impact on the brain and the dehydration and how long it takes to get those fluids back into your brain. Right. And um, the the organizations, uh, especially like the top organizations, by trying to curb this, kind of I think hurt it a little bit because now you can't rehydrate with an IV because mm. they call it performance enhancing. But man, you're not going to get if you cut a lot of weight, it's going to be really hard to get that brain pad back. And you've seen that in fights, you know, people can list tons of fights. We're like, man, that guy hardly got touched. And he went out. It's like, well, right, right. Probably, that's probably the stuff that happened beforehand. And did you, w- were you fighting at close to your, your walking weight? What, what would you yeah. Around, around there? I would, I would walk around, but you know, again, I'm walking around in pretty good shape all the time, but I'd probably be like 168 to 170 pounds. And I would fight at 155. But okay. now if you okay. pick a guy that's even walking around at 168, they fight at 135. Right, right. It's crazy. Right. It's crazy. Well, I, I remember when I was – because I, I, I had an amateur boxing match a couple of years ago, and I remember, you know, given my height, like around 5'6", I mean, I walk around at like, you know, 190, 195, and I said, well, to have any shot, I'll get down to 175. But even that was – I, I, I got to be at like – you know, in the one may at, may at one sixty eight lower if I could, but I couldn't see how how I could function really getting down more. Yeah, no, it it becomes difficult, and you really only get twenty four hours. I didn't even get that in the beginning. So, look, my fights in the beginning were same day weigh in, so wow. you had to weigh wow. in, and then you fought like three hours later. Jeez. So yeah, it was it was a little bit tougher back then. I mean, it was also the time period where you would get booked on a card people would show up they would weigh in and then they would leave they would see the first couple of fights and be like no i'm not doing it and they would just, oh, yeah. yeah and they would come in and be like hey i'm sorry but we can't find your opponent you know Damn. and then you had people like joe lozon that would show up with their gear joe lozon <laughs> would show up but he would show up with his gear and be like i'll take anybody in, in within just, 15 just ready to go <laughs> yeah because he was already to go so 
it's fun. It was a fun time. Now, now you were awarded in in 2012 the CES MMA Coach of the Year, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. What's What's the difference in preparation from when you were fighting as a competitor to now being a coach? <laughs> Well, I still train basically full time. Uh, I I train with the team because oh, for do. me, okay. yeah, I don't. Uh, I'll I'll never take that coach's role where I'm just going to sit around with my hands on my belt or whatever and just tell not your not, not your style. That's not really my style, and I still enjoy training. Like there's uh, there's fighters and there's martial artists, and this is not throwing shade at anybody, but I I kind of know which one I am, especially coming from like um, an artistic like music background. Mm. To me, the whole mm. thing is very cerebral and there's a lot of strategy to it and uh, I'm a big strategy guy. So I still can get in there and, and work with everybody mm-hmm. and, you know, be mentally a little bit more on top of, you know, they're probably a lot younger than me and in better shape, but I can still do well because, you know, I tend to be smarter and then I can take those things and pass them on to them. Like, look, I can see this. You're doing this here. Look, watch. I'm going to show you how I exploit it. Right, uh, okay. Right. Then get a little bit better idea. If I'm just talking, it's a little bit hard for people to to maybe get the gist of what I'm talking about. But if I can put it into action, mm. kind of makes a little bit more sense to him. So I mean, as long until the wheels fall off, I will be on the mats. And that's awesome. you know, after that, I'll still try to be on the mats. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that leads me to another question. Does training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu help a person's ability to problem solve and think analytically in other areas of their lives? Uh, yeah, I, I would say a hundred percent. So more, more, uh, more so I, than other martial arts, do you think? Other martial arts can, you know, I, I would say like, if you consider like striking or kickboxing, I think it's the same learning process. I think the strategy is the same. Obviously the game is a lot different, mm-hmm. but you can take that with a lot of sports. When you learn the ins and outs of like how the game is played, uh, it's a big difference you know from like playing rec or whatever you know like if you're playing rec soccer and you play with somebody that played a little like more organized on a team man they're running plays on you and everything else they're not just running around playing soccer so you know Uh, a lot of that's that's a lot of the of the of the preparation you know more so than like most of my people here are more on the martial arts side meaning mm -hmm. i started i started uh to say this whereas there's fighters and there's martial artists right and fighters to come in and when they don't have a fight, they're not really training. And then they have to do a 10-week training camp because the first three or four weeks is just getting back in shape. And mm-hmm. then they they do that. And then they disappear again. So boxers tend to do that a lot. There are still MMA guys that do that. I'm not right. a big That's fan. Patty Pimlet is like one of the, the, the biggest uh, yeah. of that, right? That's crazy. And your off time when you don't have a fight is the best time to learn. Like you're not learning new stuff in a training camp. You're sharpening the stuff that you already know. You're working with your coach. You're strat. You're coming up with a strategy for a particular person that you're fighting. That's the training camp. But you, the skills should already be there. You worked on that on your off time. So for the guys that aren't putting in the time on the off time and they're not showing up to the gym, they're not staying on the mats. They're not sharp. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to try to now you're going to come into a camp and you're going to worry about the weight cut and being on weight and learning new material and being sharp. Can't do it all, right? That's too much. The sport's too hard. There's too much going on in the sport. So you got to, you got to be serious about it. But for me, you got to have a little bit of that martial art and you got to love training. Mm. It can't Mm. just be because you like the lights on that night. However, there are some people that do very well with, with that, you know, scenario, but that's not everybody, you know, mm-hmm. there's people that can go out and go to the club the night before and take the heat off themselves and, and perform great. But yeah. that's, that's an outlier. It's that's not a recipe not, for success. Most of no, the time. Yeah. Of course not. I'm not going to recommend that as a coach. I'm not going to, you know, really put up with my guys doing that either because mm-hmm. I'm just invested in the fight as they are. So, mm-hmm. you know, if they're not taking it seriously. Why am I taking you seriously? You know, you're out at the club all the time. You're not making weight. You're showing up late for practice. You don't have your gloves. Like, mm-hmm. big part of martial arts is that kind of responsibility. And, um, you know, now I'm the older guy, so I get to hold people accountable. And it's kind of my job. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've been there, so I'm, I'm sure that they respect you for that. Well, I hope so. <laughs> and tell me, tell me about the, the music and, and, and being, the music and how that kind of correlates to, to fighting for you or just – just creativity that you get to use in music on the mat. 
Tell me about that, because I'm I'm always interested in what people do aside, you know, from just the the martial arts aspect too, and how they blend. So yeah, please. Um. Yeah. So I I grew up playing drums and playing in bands and music, and I went to school for uh, drums and percussion. Uh, I was at Berkeley College of Music for um, about two years studying up there, and then moved down to finish at Rhode Island College. It was a little bit closer to what I was doing, and I found a good professor over there. So. Um, I ended up getting a degree in classical and jazz performance. And, you know, I was just playing gigs and trying to be a session guy. But at the same time, I grew up being a hockey player. So I was always very athletic. Yeah. Um, I found Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which tended to be that yin to the yang, you know, that that balance point. And it was the physical part, but it was the same learning process as music. You know, mm. it's theory, theory and practice, theory and practice, theory and practice. You're always in the lab. Yep. You're never going to solve the puzzle. It's an yeah. endless cycle. You chase your tail until you die. But yeah, that's yeah, the process yeah. that, that we all enjoy. Like the best Striving person. Striving for that perfection, right? You're never going to get it, right? Yeah. The best people in the world are never going to get it. There's going to be that day where they lose it. Whatever Israel, Adesanya, whoever it is, they're still great. But right. nobody can hold that perfection forever. Demetrius Johnson, I, I think it was one of his best press conferences where he was like, I'm glad I lost Finally, mm -hmm. like it's going to give me something to work on. You yeah. know, those undefeated people don't know what to work on. And why would you change it if you're not losing? Right. Right. So, you know, to me, how the two correlate, not to get off topic, but like it's the same learning process. Right. You know, the learning right. process for, for learning an instrument or learning multiple instruments or just learning about music is that theory and practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say, who's, who's the best guitar player? Well, that's you know it's art it's you know right. so you right. can't really say you can say oh jimmy hendrix but then people say well technically jimmy hendrix isn't fantastic yeah but it's that we weren't asking technical you know so right 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 i also say to my guys i think technically the best fighter in the world is in a gym somewhere but can't perform under the lights yeah technically yeah. he just can't do it and I, we've right. seen that as well you know like an absolute murderer in the gym and yeah. then, but the lights come on. There's too much pressure, and the, and they can't be that person. So, and and how come how come we make such a big deal? Not not us, but people you know that that watch the fights. How come when someone loses, when their O goes, a lot of times they're written off as now a bum or no good. Why does that happen? I think a lot of that comes from boxing, because boxing there is the difference, uh, there is the difference right? In boxing, it's happens yeah. more often mma not so much well in, in boxing they they get these guys that are going to be the, the the next big thing they pad their record all the way up to their first 20 fights because if you're not 18 25 and 0 25 and 1 maybe or whatever like you're you're a journeyman if you got four losses in boxing you're a journeyman and it's because they tried to build you up and you lost against the next level of competition like you didn't make it mm -hmm. but in mma you know, you're going. You can go up that ladder pretty quick. You can get to yeah. four and five and zero, oh, and then you're moving on to you know the top, whatever a hundred people in the world in your weight class, which that's a big that jump. Right. And if you get on people that were of lower caliber, and now you get to that big show, that's a big jump. Mm -hmm. so I try to have my guys not have easy fights to pad a record to get to that next level. Like you want to be battle tested when you get there, yeah, and it's okay to lose. You know what I mean? Get out there. Keep fighting. You want to be battle tested. You want to know what it's like to win. You want to know what it's like to lose big. You want to feel all that stuff. So when you get there, you're ready. And I've right. seen so many people get there and I know they're not ready. They didn't really fight anybody. And now they're yeah. taking a huge jump up in competition. So, you know, if I had to live and learn, I know we had a fight in my day. It was just like, if you got an opponent, you just had to say yes. Cause it was, you weren't just getting a list of opponents that right, were coming right. All these different gyms. Pete, how how does a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner get someone to the ground, especially when fighting a boxer that typically is trained at managing distance and working at range? Well, we don't fight in a cornfield, so uh, eventually, by uh, cutting off the ring, cutting off the cage, whatever you're fighting in, that's going to be your angle you know, as a as a grappler. Mm -hmm. You, you just think that you're going to roll in at, with somebody who's good at, you know, maybe using the jab and they got really good footwork. Um, you know, sometimes wrestlers tend to move in straight lines 
And for a good boxer that has good footwork, that's going to make it very hard for you to get where you want to be. You know, you want to get to that clinch. You want to push against the cage. They're going to practice not getting there. So Mm. you have to have, as an MMA fighter, you have to have the ability to make that person think that we're striking. We're going to have a striking contest. I need you to think that I'm going to comply and strike with you. Now, I'm a striker Mm. as well. All of our guys are strikers. Mm. We practice just like we practice Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So you you have to be well-rounded. But if you're going to go and say you're a black belt and then you want to get your striking good enough to work your jiu-jitsu, like that happens a lot too. You know, you you have a facet that you're much better than in the sport of mixed martial arts and you're going to use that as your ace card. But if it means you're going to get it there, you know, that's what, that's the, the practice. So you have to have, abilities to make people think we're striking so you can get close enough so they let down that guard so it doesn't look like you're always trying to get in and get and go for that takedown and then usually once you can get to that clinch position and you can work somebody up against the cage um if they're a majority of a striker and they're just trying to get out that's that's usually going to be bad news that's bad yeah however in martial arts these days people are pretty well-rounded you have to be from from what you just said. You you have to be well versed, and as you said, you you train in the stand up uh, striking game as well because it necessity. I'm sure. Yeah, you have to. And what's the difference, Pete, in applying uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or grappling in sport competition versus using it on the street for self defense? And how do you prepare your students for those two scenarios? I'm kind of glad you asked that. This is something I. I preach in class all the time and we are a mixed martial arts school but for me brazilian jiu-jitsu the the number one thing brazilian jiu-jitsu should be is Mm self-defense whether it's a mma fight or you're in class or you're on the street brazilian jiu-jitsu should be your number one form of self-defense so i'm not a big sport jiu-jitsu guy Mm -hmm. i don't like a lot of these moves where you're underhooking the leg and you know trying to trying to reach under and leave your face out there where if you were on the street, even an inexperienced person would just start punching your face. in. so they don't, they don't care about the points and getting a sweep and getting on top when they're just going to hit you. So I don't have a lot of that in my game. It's not that Mm -hmm. I don't do it, but if you talk to like a military person or a combat person, or even any of the other fighters, they're going to tell you it's war. And when you have to do fight or flight, the first three things or two things that come to your brain are the things that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So for example, Mm -hmm. if you were a high school wrestler and you practice in you, now you're training mixed martial arts and it's your first fight. Mm -hmm. I guarantee when things start to go south a little bit, you're going right back to exactly what you practiced all those years. That's that's what you do. So if the number one thing that you're going to do is deep half guard, that's that's not that's not good on the street you know Mm. that's not the best position you want to end up being that's not a good self-defense spot that shouldn't be the first two or three things to come to your brain in a combat situation so if you talk about self-defense i i don't like sport jujitsu at all Mm. and i try not to have those things so my jujitsu game if i'm wearing the gi which i tend to wear the gi a lot i also tend to wear no gi a lot and i want to get it to where I feel comfortable and I want to get everybody else to feel comfortable where it doesn't matter if you're wearing the gi or you're not wearing the gi. Yeah. You should have gain or, or it's MMA. It shouldn't yeah. matter that there's punches. You should always act like somebody can punch you in the face. You right. should always right. have control over their hands and their biceps and the things that are going to do damage cross face. It's all there. The, the hands and the arms do the most damage. If I said, Hey, let's wrestle, but mm-hmm. we're not going to use any arms. I'm going to, you can use arms and I can't. You're going to probably win. Yeah. Arms are a huge part of grappling, punching, mixed martial arts. So if you can't understand how to tie the arms up and play a game where it's a little bit more self-defense, it's not yeah. going to work for you in a combat situation. So um, yeah. that's that's what I preach. It's not that I don't like competition. We have plenty of people that do compete. Uh, honestly, if it's a points competition, I we train like the last two weeks. And I go, okay, listen, here's the rules for points. Yep. Let's try to change our strategy a little bit here. But overall, I'm going to say don't try to win on points. Play your game. Yeah. Because if you change what you do all the time in the gym, it, it, you're not going to be the, the right person when you go out there. You're right. going to try to be right. a different grappler, and that's not what you trained for. So if you trained to be relaxed 
and to not worry too much about the positions and be successful, then do that. You yeah. know, just pay a little bit more attention to, you know, the points and how they score points in side control and, and don't get too down. But I would I mean, rather have people not change their game. Try to win. Try to submit somebody. Try to submit. Well, uh, along those lines, hit me up with your your favorite submission, your go-to that you used in competition to tap someone out and one you've always dreamed of using in competition. Oh, man. Um <laughs> Well, for a long period of time when I was fighting, uh, I have a pretty good 10-finger guillotine. Um, So that was one of them. I want to say more recently, I would probably say Japanese necktie. I have a decent version of a Japanese necktie that I have a lot of my – I mean, now I would say that's probably one of the better ones because people don't see it coming. So I have a lot of students that have, you know, won IBJF, you know, world titles with it and – you know, it, it tends to be the go-to move when people turtle or, you know, they, they start turning in from bottom side control. So uh, we've got a, a pretty tricky game. I always say when I compete, I'm pretty relaxed about it because I've been doing it for well over 20 years. So yeah. my yeah. philosophy is you better trick me pretty well to get me because I've seen a lot of stuff. <laughs> You've seen a lot of Which, stuff, man. But that's, that's it. And knowledge is key, right? If you know it's coming, you can be relaxed and defend. It's the ones that catch you off guard are when you get caught. So right, we try right, to come right. up with those ones that not everybody's doing. Yep. You come up with a couple of slick setups for it, and by the time people realize they're in it, it's too late. Too late. Yeah, man. And, 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 and then, tell me now, now, your wife, Megan, is a co-owner and also practices BJJ herself? Yeah. So uh, we were together for about nine years, and she always said, I'm never going to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I don't like that close contact, blah, blah, yeah. blah. I'm never going to do it. Okay, cool. Then we had a daughter. And uh, she started doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at three. Oh, wow. And my wife is sitting there with with the other parents. And she's just like, how can I tell my daughter that she needs to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I don't do it? And then she said this to the other parent. And the other parents like, you know, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So she was like, well, we all don't really know that much. So why don't we just have our own class while the kids are training? And I, I sent a coach over and. Uh, it started from that. They just started to dabble when their kids were dabbling in it. And, you know, to this day, a lot of those women stayed and That's they're, awesome. they're pretty good niche. My wife's almost a brown belt at this point. So it's been a long time. I think it's been like eight years or seven years. So, and, and, um, and tell me, do you, do you train and roll together? And if so, who gets okay. the better of those exchanges? Well, I mean, I have a lot of experience and I'm a little bit bigger, but I'll tell you what, she's, She's a tough role for sure. Like she's a tough role for anybody. And she's, uh, she's aggressive, which I like, uh, as a girl, you have to go and be, uh, confident in your techniques and just that confidence, I think changes how people, uh, receive you. Mm-hmm. If you're coming at it a little bit wishy-washy and like, oh, I don't know, my techniques kind of work. Like she's no, yeah. they're not going to believe it. They're going to walk all over you. Same thing with striking, right? Posture is everything. So yeah. she comes out, she's very confident and she's smart. You know, I don't, I, I, with my daughter and my wife and now my son trains, he's, he's six and he's, uh, he's an animal as well, which is good because it's hard to get people to be aggressive. Yeah. Um, and we have to do a lot, but especially with kids, because fighting is weird, you know, and they have people grabbing you and taking you down. But once you get comfortable with it, you mentioned this earlier and we started to talk about how it affects, um, other parts of their life and yeah. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu changing people's confidence. And that's really one of the number one things is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu changes people's confidence. My wife um, was a nurse for a long period of time. And when she started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, things changed for her at work. She started to get raises. She started to become management. Wow. They started to ask her to do different positions because she's, I think, understood more what it was like to be a leader, but also how to get, you know, how to deal with getting. And- yeah, well, you're getting smashed. Your yeah. ego is getting crushed on a daily basis. So you usually leave here, especially in the beginning, going, well, I'm still here. You know, that was tough, but I, I think I'm kind of getting it. And you come back yeah. for more. You come back for more. And that builds your confidence because then you start seeing yourself doing better. Right. And you say, well, right. if I can do something this hard. Right. How, I should be I – can, I can take that into my job. I can take that into yeah, how yeah. I talk to I can take yeah. that how I carry myself and, and it, you know, run my it own teaches, business. It's resiliency. It's resiliency training as well. That's it. That's sure. it. You do things that are hard. You know, other things become a lot easier. Absolutely. And Pete, before I let you go, man, this has been awesome. But tell me, 2024, 
What's Triforce MMA got in store? What do you guys got? Um, more championships, titles. We want to play some, uh, you know, more people at the, at the top of the sport in the UFC. Uh, this weekend, we've got John Duma, who's already a champion at 135 pounds. He's going to be on yeah. Fight Path. Uh, defending his title. Uh, we're pretty confident that he's going to have a good title defense and, and he'll be moving on to uh, the next level. We've got Gary Berletto, who's defending his title two weeks later. We've got some absolute studs that are making their, their pro debut uh, on the same cards in the next two weeks. One CES uh, and the other one's going to be over at, uh, at Shriners uh, in Massachusetts. So awesome. Awesome. they're pretty good, good promotions. Uh, we've got a bunch of other people with some experience, like uh, we got Coach Dan Cormier. He's making his last appearance. He's wow. been a warrior for like the last maybe 12 years out there competing, crushing it, always giving up weight. He walked around at 128, fights at 125. You know, he's gone down to 115 when he's had a competition, but he's had a great yes. career. Um, he's also one of my black belts here. He's also been the longest coach I've had here. He's probably been working for, for us for probably – 13 out of the 12 to 13 out of our 15 years that we've been wow. open. So wow. uh, we're real happy for him. You know, he's getting married soon and he's looking forward to doing more coaching and, and we're happy to have him. So that's it's, awesome, man. Hey Pete, thank you so much for the time for, for, for taking the time right after class, man. Go, oh, thanks go get, for having me. Is, go get a shower, great. get a beer. You've earned yeah, it. Know, man. <laughs> oh man. Thanks so much, Michael. I appreciate uh, you having me on here and, um, I look forward to hearing more stuff from you guys. Hey, thanks, man. I, I hope to check out the uh, the new place. I gotta I gotta come through and uh, and hit you up. Look, look me up anytime you're here. I'd love to show you around. Thanks, my man. As we close tonight's episode of Between Rounds, we leave inspired by the journey of Professor Pete Jeffrey, from his early days discovering Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to becoming a cornerstone of MMA coaching in New England. Pete's story is a testament to the transformative power of martial arts. His dedication to the sport, his students, and his own continuous learning reminds us that martial arts is not just about fighting. It's about growth, resilience, and the pursuit of excellence. Whether it's through the discipline of training, the thrill of competition, or the day-to-day -day lessons in leadership and perseverance, Pete Jeffrey embodies the true essence of a martial artist. Thank you for joining us for an enlightening conversation with Professor Pete Jeffrey. Until next time, this has been Mike Petraka encouraging you to keep fighting your good fight, both on and off the mat.